Okay, let's move on to Paula. Yep, Paula, are you available? There's Paula. Hi, Paula. You're on mute. Can Here you... I am. What do yeah, we... I didn't want to miss this opportunity for you guys to see my beautiful face today. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? Everybody okay? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, perfect. Okay, I'm Paula with SPT, uh, Specialized Pipe Technologies. We are uh, a uh, distributor and uh, we do lining for pipe in lieu of replacement, <clears throat> excuse me, pipe replacement. So we can line pipe and never have to take up your foundations and destroy your walls. Excellent, thank we you very much. We have a lot of issues everywhere in Florida. Yep. Absolutely. Tom with APB Security. Okay, uh, I'm gonna introduce Tom. He couldn't make it today, uh, last minute changes. And uh, so just to let, so you, let you know about, about security. security. Uh, he wanted me to let y'all know that they are in business 15 years covering the Tri-County area. They are the boots on the ground. Uh, they are the guards that wave at you when you pull into communities. Uh, they have an outstanding program with 125 officers and they service about 60 communities. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Someone who needs no introduction, Don Miller. Oh, you're on mute, Don. I do appreciate that, Rudy. My name's Dawn Miller with The Paving Lady. We are a full service asphalt contractor that's been in business since 1985. We do asphalt overlays, seal coating, ADA upgrades to your common areas and parking lots. We also do concrete curbs and sidewalks. If you have an issue in your parking lot or roadways, it's your own asphalt, so give me a call. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Carmelo with United Professional Engineering. He's not here. I think Peggy's going to go ahead and introduce uh, his company and their services. Okay. Um, thank you again. Carmelo has been in business as United Professional Engineering for 20 years, uh, servicing all of Florida, uh, primarily in the Tri-County area, um, and will go down to Miami-Dade as well. Um, he has a full staff of services. If you need anything, specializes in concrete restoration, uh, you can give him a call. Thank you. And once again, we'll go, just go ro ro roll right into uh, PuroClean. Tell us a little bit about PuroClean. Okay, and just to mention, Jimmy is on so he can follow me. Um, so good morning, everyone. I am Peggy West, and I'm pleased to announce uh, kind of my debut here that I have joined the PureClean team as of two weeks ago. Uh, PureClean is a trusted partner for damage restoration. Uh, this is for fire, water, mold, and biohazard treatments. Uh, we've been in business since 2001, 300 offices nationally and all over Florida. So if you need anything uh, in this area, please give me a shout. And thanks for joining us today. I'm going to turn this over to Jimmy. Still having some audio problems with you. We'll get back to you at the end of the show. We, uh, we, have, uh, we have some time. So once you get the audio figured out, let us know. And we'll, um, we'll get back to you. Um, a list of all the sponsors and a list of all the panelists, an email, a contact list. We'll go out to all the participants on the on call. The call. So, so you need, need to have. To have um, um, their name or their services, um, you'll have an email with that shortly. Uh, let me introduce Andy. Uh, Andy Schrader is our licensed engineer at Money and Painting and Waterproofing. Um, he is very well decorated. He is a state certified contractor. He also works with the urban search and rescue team. Um, he's been trained by FEMA, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, after a hurricane takes place. He's, he's part, part of the rescue team who inspects buildings. buildings. Um, he's um, very he's well de de decorated. One of the smartest guys I know. Um, not one of the best looking guys, but I don't hold that against them. I try, call him one of my true friends. And uh, Andy, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Rudy. I appreciate the introduction. And I believe somebody's going to give me the screen here. So I click share screen. Let me see how this works. OK, how are we looking on that screen? Can you guys see that? We can. Thanks. OK, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Pre-project planning and compliance considerations. 
And what we're going to talk about today, how do we find a great contractor, how do we qualify them to make sure that they are um, uh, suitable for the planned work that we have going on, and most importantly, keep out of trouble with the city, county, and federal regulations that just seem to be getting worse here with, uh, with COVID-19 going on. And uh, specifically, we're talking about planning renovations or repair work. Um, this is my first time using this microphone setup today, so if it sounds a little weird or I'm talking too loud, just give me a heads up and um, I'll adjust it. And uh, Rudy, if you don't mind, to keep an eye on those questions like you did last time, and if we have questions, we'll uh, we'll address them as they come up during the during the presentation. I'd appreciate that. Contractors, who's going to do it? Uh, permits, what are they going to mess with and potentially mess up in your building? Uh, environmental and as, asbestos regulations. Uh, is what they're touching hazardous? Do we need to care about it and, and care about what's going on? So let me set my watch here, so I'm not uh, so I'm paying good attention to your guys' time. A um, little bit of background on me, Rudy, Rudy kind of gave you the, the heads up. Um, I have my bachelor's and master's degrees in civil structural engineering. Um, I'm a licensed PE, a special inspector of threshold buildings, a certified general contractor, and an asbestos consultant. Um, you might think all those letters behind my name mean I'm really smart. They don't. They just mean I don't have a girlfriend and I have a lot of time on my hands. So that's, you know, that's a good thing. That's a plus, right? Um, I worked as a consultant engineer before uh, joining the dark side and becoming a scumbag contractor. So, you know, here I am with you guys today. Kidding. Kidding. Everybody's ready to go, right? So here's one of my cats. Contractor qualifications. What do we think about? Um, we, we've got a lot of people that are involved in large projects. We got the builder there on the left looking all scuzzy, um, the uh, the engineer looking all nerdy-like, and then you got the architect over there in the red pants looking just, you no, know, he completely doesn't belong. And... Um, you know, hopefully there's no architects inside this presentation, but I like this little joke. We, we love architects. Uh, they don't get enough credit for what they do. They actually have a lot of training, and um, in some cases they have more power and responsibility for engineers. But um, right now we're talking about contractors and, and what we need to look at. So quick things that, you know, you, you managers that have been in this game for 10, 20 years, you already know about. But, you know, we want to look at getting written quote uh, written quote for the scope of work. Um, very importantly, has the contractor completed a project similar to yours? So when we ask for references, we don't just ask for general references. We, ref we ask for references that, that look a lot like the specific job that we're looking at doing. Um, we want detailed proposals in writing. We want to get uh, as much information up front as we can. Otherwise, it's like ordering a cheeseburger and then getting charged for every condiment you want to put on there. Oh, you wanted mustard on this cheeseburger? That's an extra 25 cents. Oh, you want, you know... Uh, ketchup. Here's a, that's a dollar. Sorry. So um, ketchup shortage in the world. Ketchup now costs a dollar to add to your cheeseburger. So nobody wants that, and that's why we uh, we want to get detailed proposals in writing up front before selecting a contractor. Um, one of the lawyers over here on my side of the fence, uh, Alan Tannenbaum, brought up a good point yesterday about uh, payment and performance bonds on on jobs, and and we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into the contract. Um, so just another that's kind of a self reminder for me. One thing is, is uh, I, I stole this from the Sarasota County Building Department, so that's why some of this stuff says Sarasota. Not the presentation, but just a couple of these slides. Um, this is from Sarasota Building Department, and what we say is, look, make sure that this person is licensed locally as well as statewide. So, you know, obviously, if they're saying they're a certified general contractor, you can look them up on DBPR. We'll get into that, but they should also have a local contracting license to perform that work most of the time. Um, we already talked, talked about... about Sorry, Sorry, I got, I got some, feedback. some feedback. Are you guys getting feedback too, or is that just me? No? Uh, there was okay. a, one of the panelists that wasn't muted. Uh, that's been taken care of. We're good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. It just threw me for a second. Um, so we, we talked about asking for references. We, look, we can look for local business tax receipts to make sure that this is not some shade tree uh, fly-by-night individual that we're looking at getting into a thing here. Um, why would we require licensed contractors? We want people that have construction licenses for, for what they do. Otherwise, things might end up going wrong on a project like they did in this case. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Here's another good one. So that didn't work out. Let's see what we got. Oh, this was this is a great one. So we, we want licensed individuals, people that can read plans, people that, who uh, hopefully this isn't their first project or their third project, but more uh, more of a bigger number. A couple of red flags and warning signs when we're 
looking at hey, let me stop with... you right there i got a couple of questions that are relative to license we might as well tackle them now do you questions have to license good. to remove mold in florida jerry wants to know sure uh ger generally speaking yes you have to be licensed to remove mold um mold abatement is, is a licensed category so that's a state certified license that you can get as is mold assessment um, there are some there's a lot of loopholes with mold and a lot of it is going to come down to your local jurisdiction because in some cases mold removal can be included as part of a larger project um, but generally speaking yes you need it with some exceptions is there any additional license that they should get to be project managers in florida that are, I guess, I guess, relative. Uh, Glermo wants to know, um, are there any additional license that managers can get that will kind of prepare them for construction projects that you know of? Andy, you with us? Andy, I think we seem to have lost your audio. Yep, his audio just dropped. He just let me know. He's uh he's working on it. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you everybody who is uh, attending. Just hold with us here while we uh, get this audio straightened out. I'll answer some questions. John uh, Hicks, you wanna know um, if you can get some of these slides. Absolutely, I'll contact you um, after the call. And we'll, yeah. Guys, can you hear me? We can talk about it. Hey, there he is. Hey, Rudy. Yes, we can hear you. We also have a question on- Hey, Rudy, you can yeah. hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry. For some reason, my headset dropped out. So I'm gonna stop using this headset. So I apologize if the audio is bad quality. I, I lost like two minutes there where I couldn't hear you. So my apologies to everybody, but we'll, we'll get back on track. Well, it's a good thing you weren't flying a plane then. <laughs> All right, so we had a couple questions. questions. Um, if we didn't get to them, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, you can go ahead and proceed. Okay. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Thanks very much for uh, for bearing with me. Um, okay, so th this is why we want licensed contractors and, and warning signs of unlicensed contractors would include some of these following. Um, a lot of times the contractor will say, hey, the county takes too long to get a permit. We don't really need a permit for this. You know, we'll be fine. Now, with that being said, lately permits are taking incredibly long times, way longer than they used to. Um, in some cases, people are reverting to using uh, private providers of inspections for their inspections, and they can also uh, work with private plan reviewers who actually work with the county to provide, uh, to, to perform plan review and get it done a lot more quickly than the county has been doing it. So yes, permits taking a long time is a real thing, but if the contractor's first words to you are, hey, you know, contractor, the permit's going to take too long, we don't need to worry about it, that's probably a, a, a red flag. Um, we also want to worry about large down payments requested before the work begins. So, you know, 10% uh, down payment, 15% down payment, or, you know, what we would call a mobilization fee, that's, that's kind of standard. But once you start getting above 10, 15%, it starts to become uh, called into question. So just, just take a really good look at that. And then, of course, um, anything where you have uh, trying to make cash payments, or if they ask you to write checks to a different company name than, than they're telling you they are, that's, that's a warning sign. So that's, that's a couple of things that we want to look look at. Um, we want a contract, right? We don't want handshake agreements unless we're dealing with uh, with about a fifty dollar transaction. Um, 
if the contractor is only willing to work on weekends or after hours, that's a big red flag. And we actually see that pretty commonly. Somebody who has a day job working for some other construction company, and then they want to, uh, then they say, yeah, we, we'll, we'll do this tonight. <laughs> red flag, right? Um, look on sunbiz.org. It's so easy to look people up and, and see what they're doing. Uh, you should be able to see a record. You can see how long they've been in business uh, very easily. And then um, I'll just skip forward. Last thing that I see a lot is I see a lot of handyman deals and, and jack of all trades. Uh, as Sarasota County says, there's no such thing as a handyman's license in Sarasota County or at the state level. And generally speaking, if someone's calling themselves a handyman, that's that's kind of a, at least for me, that that's kind of an instant red flag if I'm, you know, contemplating doing actual structural work. We uh, we have some ways to verify contractors' license. We talked about going to SunBiz to look up their company, and then we can go to myfloridalicense.com to to look at their license. Um, you managers that are on here that are are used to dealing with that, you'll you'll have seen this before. So for example, if you looked up Andrew Trader here, you can see, you can see everything that that I have and hopefully it's still current and active. And um, that's that's how we look people up and we can actually see, are they licensed to perform this work? Um, when you see a bunch of letters after a person's name, uh, CGC, for example, or uh, CCC, which is roofing, uh, th this is this is what a bunch of that means. So we, we have all these different designations and here's a list of, of what all those different things mean so you can look it up. And um, I'll be glad to send you guys this after the course if, if you want to look it up. But you, you can see there's all different kinds of things going on. There's specialty structural contractor, somebody who, who works with guardrails a lot. Um, and yet a demolition contractor can also be called a SCC. So it's confusing, but we, we can look it up pretty easily by just referring to this list. Generally speaking, with construction contractors, there's there's three state certified levels. Uh, the highest level is going to be a general contractor. So they're up here, they can work on buildings of unlimited height and size. And next we have a building contractor who can work on buildings that are up to three stories in size. And they can also perform non-structural repairs on any size building. So if, they, uh, if they're painting a building uh, say it's a 20 story high rise, they can paint that high rise, that's non-structural. Um, but if you start getting to do with anything with the structure, they, they have to have that license. Um, the lowest of the three state certified categories would be a residential contractor, which is CRC, and they can do uh, one family or two family dwellings, uh, but the trick is it has to be two stories or less. So to recap, residential contractors, two stories or less, and it can only be you know family homes, building contractor is up to three stories. Um, and then a general contractor is everything, anywhere, buildings of unlimited height and size. So that's that's who you wanna look at and who you wanna to try to do business with. Um, before getting into contracts, do we have any questions about license types and categories and what they can do? Seeing nothing. Um, uh, at this time, thank you. Okay. So once you found a contractor, uh, you want to look at starting a contract. Um, there are two main categories that we see in construction. Um, AIA, which is American Institute of Architects, that's generally speaking the standard for the construction industry in the United States. And then there's EJCDC, Engineers Joint Contract Documents Committee. Uh, to put it bluntly, the, uh, the EJCDC is, is just an absolute pain in the ass to work with. Um, it's very much geared towards the association and against the contractor. Pretty much no matter what goes wrong, it, it's going, the, the contractor is going to pay for it. So if I'm the association, I want an EJCDC. The, the, the problem is many contractors will not work with that particular document and they'll just say, yeah, sorry, you know, this is the wrong job for us. Um, generally speaking, the AIA or American Institute of Architects contract is, uh, geared to be fair towards both sides and it's it's generally fair and, and pretty easy to work with if you have a construction lawyer he he will have worked with with that uh, contract before most likely um questions about contracts before moving on or just, just feel free to comment at any time things we think about when we're you know once we get into the project obviously we want to take a look at what's going on we want to keep records. Um, 
the keyword before we sign off and make final payment, make sure that you have inspected and, and that you're good with everything. Generally speaking, don't make a final payment until they, they show you that the job has been finaled out and that if there was a permit, that the permit has been finaled out. Um, that is also the time that we would request releases of lien and final releases of lien from the contractor to make sure that there are no subcontractors out there that this uh, individual hasn't paid on the project. So look at the work, make sure you get your releases of lien, make sure you get wa your warranties, and then you can release payment. Um, generally speaking, there is not a huge rush to pay the contractor. Don't feel pressured until you're comfortable. Um, that's not to say to un unfairly withhold payment from the contractor, but you have to get this stuff in writing. You have to get your warranties. You have to get your releases of lien and then release the check. Okay. Questions on this part that we have before moving on? Nothing in the Q&A box. We will see if we have anything at the end during the panel discussion. I don't think we need to stretch because everyone's at home and comfortable, right? So we're going to keep moving. We talked about permitting considerations. Uh, or sorry, we're talking about permit considerations now. Um, these are a lot of things that will almost always require a permit. Um, if you're messing with the AC system, if you're demolishing any structure, you know, electrical work, um, anything to do with, with plumbing will usually require a permit. Um, here are some more of these things. If, if we're replacing a roof, we need it. Um, soffits fascia you know not a lot of people think about soffits and fascia but usually that requires a permit and that's because it's considered a cladding element that's attached to the building so it's it's under a technicality it's it's considered part of the structure so these are all things that do usually require permit documents to be in place on the other side of the spectrum these things usually will not need a permit so work of a strictly cosmetic nature, um, look at painting right there. So if you're looking at exterior painting on a building, normally you will not need a permit. Now, every jurisdiction is different. So every county in Florida requires different things. Um, in, in on the, a lot of areas on the west side of the state don't require permits. Some areas over there in West Palm Beach, for example, are more strict and they, and they do require permits. So, it just depends, but oftentimes painting is, does, doesn't require a permit for, for anywhere. So things like painting, wallpapering, carpeting, et cetera. Minor roof repairs don't usually require a permit. And then um, some of those other things below usually will not need it as well. So we have some things that we know almost always need a permit, some things usually don't. Um, here's another good list of things where you always need a permit. You don't even have to think about it. You just hear these keywords and you can say, okay, yep, we're definitely going to need it for this. Anytime you're dealing with walls, cutting away of a wall, uh, doesn't matter whether or not the contractor tells you it's non-structural. If it's a wall, plan on getting the permit un unless you've had a, an engineer or an architect look at it and tell you otherwise. Um, anytime, anything you're doing with a structural beam or, or load bearing and then egress. So egress means basically can you make your way out of the building if there's a fire or some other emergency so those are our egress paths so for example if we're doing something that's going to reduce the width of a hallway that would be messing with the egress path um, if we have operable windows and we can get out the window and you say no we want to take out this we're going to block in this window and just make it into a wall that is affecting your egress paths and usually you'll need a permit and uh Hint, usually the building department really does not like it when we mess with paths of egress. So if you're taking out a window, they're gonna wanna make sure that you put in some other means to get out of the building or get out of that room. So th those are some cases where we nearly always need a permit. Last, anything to do with water supply, sewers, gas, or electric. Those are all keywords that in your head you say, okay, I I'm gonna need a permit for this. Rudy, is my audio still okay with this? Am I, am I still looking good? Yep. Okay. Sound amazing. Amazing? Wow. Thanks. Amazing. You could do voiceover commercial work if this doesn't work out. Did I tell you I'm a pilot, Rudy? You did. Twice. <laughs> so um, th that's when we usually need stuff for permits. And, you know, people usually hate me because I say, you're going to need a permit for this, also this, this, and this. So that, that's why I have my judgmental cat here saying, you know, people don't like to hear that they need a permit because it slows everything down and makes things more expensive. But 
it also keeps uh, our building safe and the residents in our building safe. So I like permits personally. Um, do we have any questions from Good. this? We're talking about that. Seeing none, I'm gonna continue. We do, we do have a question. So are there specific contractors that specialize in pool renovations for new pools for um, HOA developments? Okay, um, are there specific contractors that, that work in pools? Let's go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cycle back through the slides and we're gonna look at our list here. And I think we're gonna find that a pool contractor, there we go. Uh, so close to the bottom of the list, you'll see swimming pool slash spa servicing contractor or a residential pool person, CPC. So that, that looks like it is a state certified license that you can get for that kind of work. Hey Rose, I hope that answered your question. Also, um, networking, trade shows, I do know a few pool, pool contractors. Um, I'll relay that information to you and hopefully that will help with your project. Thanks. Other questions, Rudy? Well, not a question, but, but um, when it comes to uh, plumbing specifically, like for instance, uh, we do lining, so we do not have to pull a permit. Mm -hmm. But if we are, say we're doing uh, lining an entire system, but there's a 10 foot section that we're gonna replace, we have to pull a permit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, <laughs> so that's So it gets a, a little hairy when you get into the plumbing department. That, that's a great point, and I'm assuming that the reason you don't have to pull a permit for that is because the, the building code is going to consider that maintenance. And so the, the, the Florida Building Code and Mechanical Code, for a lot of things that are maintenance, you, you do not require a permit. And to give you an example from the construction side, when we are doing liquid applied roof coatings, so we can coat and waterproof a roof, and usually that will not require a permit because it is considered maintenance under the Florida Building Code. So that that's a great point, and uh, and thanks for thanks for bringing that up. All right. Thank you. I yep. I don't think we need to stretch. We're gonna keep moving. So here's we talked about. Oh, okay. I wanna, I'm sorry. I wanted to interject that that was Paula from SPT Pipe. So we talked about when you need a permit and when you usually do not need a permit. We talked about how people don't like me because I'm always the one telling them they they need permits for this work. And there's my sad <laughs> little girl, my happy little girl. Um, section three of three, environmental considerations. So what are some of the regulations that we need to look at here? Um, these are things that are not necessarily widely realized, but they, um, they come to bite some people. And, and uh, that, that's why we talk about it here. Um, so getting into asbestos, can somebody comment and give me a couple of reasons for why we care about asbestos? And my reason might not be the primary reason that you think. <laughs> it causes cancer. Can cause cancer, that's a good point. Um, mostly I care about asbestos because uh, not so much for the health aspect, but it's because I'm gonna get fined if I don't care about it. And I like money and I like keeping my money. Um, <laughs> So a lot of these counties, uh, Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, areas on the East Coast as well, they have their own air quality divisions that, that go out to basically look for contractors performing work on buildings. And what happens is if they come onto your project and they find that you have not performed an asbestos uh, test, they, they can fine you. The interesting thing about this is not just the contractor gets fined, but the association gets gets a pretty steep fine as well. And these fines can be in the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. So a lot of times when we're thinking about regulations and following construction regulations, you know, we think, okay, that's that's on the contractor. They have to worry about that. But in the case of asbestos, you get joint fines. So the, the contractor and the association gets that. Um, testing for asbestos is actually a federal regulation. So. It is a federal mandate, and then the state EPA has a hand in it, and then even under that, the, the local counties um, have a hand in it. So whether or not your, your local county enforces it strictly, it is actually a federal mandate that, that requires testing in many of these situations. Um, who can give me a building activity which would potentially disturb asbestos? Could you comment on that, or can you, can you say it out loud? 
Water damage, where you have to tear up the walls and. Yep. That, so that's a good one. Survey. Absolutely. What about landscaping? Is it ever? Is it always associated with the building? Is it ever associated with maybe some concrete in an underground parking garage or in planter beds or anything like that? So landscaping in planter beds, that's a good one, Rudy. Um, I didn't even think about that, but, but yes, that's, that can be true. And th what you're doing in that case is you're disturbing the concrete. Um, so yes, that, that's potentially a thing. Anytime we're, we're messing with walls or floor surfaces, that can be something that's going to uh, basically disturb asbestos when we would potentially need a test. Um, here is a more complete list. So some of these things are, are obvious, right? If we're demolishing a building, uh, but some are less obvious. If we're doing maintenance on some of our HVAC systems, um, if we're doing floor or, um, you know, even, even roofing work technically requires an asbestos test. It's not very often enforced, but the, the rule, the law is there. So the, this is a more complete list of things that potentially can disturb asbestos. And it's not just on the contractor, it's on the the community association manager and the association to think about these things as well. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, who can tell me what types of materials would contain asbestos? Any ideas? Insulation. Insulation, that, so that's very common. Um, stucco, concrete, um, you people, you uh, managers that own the old school condominiums from the 1970s where you have those giant wall size mirrors, um, very often if you take off those mirrors, you will see that they're adhered to the wall with a black mastic. And that black mastic is almost always asbestos containing. So anytime you see big mirrors in, in a, inside of a condo unit, it's usually going to have asbestos uh, behind that mirror with a mastic. Um, if we see nine by nine floor tiles, so uh, uh, basically a, a nine by nine floor tiles in, in bathrooms, a lot of times that will be adhered with, with a black mastic that is, uh, is nasty and contains asbestos. So those are some of the things that do contain it. Um, and then there are some things that we say, okay, we know that we don't have to worry about this if we're disturbing it. Uh, glass. Glass is a, a non-asbestos containing material. We don't care about it just because you're smashing glass. Natural wood. So, you know, if, if we have wood railings, if we have wood on um, a, a wood deck or something like that, we can look at that and say, okay, we know this does not contain asbestos, so we know that we don't need to worry about it. And then things like metal, and it's just metal, or if it's steel, th those types of things we say, okay, we don't worry about that. We know we don't need to test it. So there aren't many of those, but those things do exist. Um, so here's a little quiz. And basically, tell me if, if any of these things apply. And we can say, OK, we, we don't need an asbestos test. So here's the first thing. Our building is too new. It was built after 1995. So do we need an asbestos test if we're doing something on the building in that case? Who can tell me? Anybody? Bueller? I'd say always because you don't know what China's sending us. <laughs> that is a great point. And um, unfortunately, some of those uh, countries in the East are manufacturing building materials that we use. And although America has, uh, the United States has stopped using asbestos in most of our materials, it's still widely used um, in, in some of those nations and we do still get it. So we remember Chinese drywall um, it's, it's kind of the same thing. We're still getting building materials from there. Um, so the, the answer is there is no, there is no, uh, th there's no limitation on that. A building could have been constructed in January of this year in 2020, and we absolutely still have to get an asbestos test if we're performing that kind of work. Um, federal education or imprisonment purposes, uh, they still need it, especially in schools. If we're messing with schools, they're even more strict about it. Um, it doesn't matter if a building is for commercial use. It doesn't matter if a building is a, a, a series of townhomes. They've all got to get it. The only exception on this list is a single family freestanding home. So if you have um, one family that lives in, in their house and it's not connected to any other uh, units, that can be the exception where you do not need an asbestos test. Even with that, 
you have to be careful because sometimes if it's part of a larger community, different rules can come into play. But if it's a single family freestanding home, sometimes that will be exempt from the testing. Hey, Andy, thanks. Um, so there was a question. Does the age of the building tell you if you have to do an asbestos test? Mm -hmm. if, it's the, not, if, it's, if it's single family, no. If, it's not, if it is not single family, then yes, you have to get a test, period. Correct. So anytime you have multifamily housing, all of our HOAs, all of our residential associations where we have you know, three or four units together, that, that needs it, even though we, we don't usually think about it when we look at those areas. And um, the thing about the age, every time I tell someone they need an asbestos test, I get that same response. Oh, it, this, was, this was too new. Well, no, it's not too new. Nothing is too new. Um, I get a lot of people say, but it's an emergency. We had a water leak. So what do you guys think? If you have a water leak, and look, we got to get this work done right now. Um, you know, it's flooding someone's unit. Do you still need an asbestos test? What's the answer on that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's our answer. No one cares. Um, here's the deal. You still have to complete the work. Go ahead and, and, and make your emergency repair. That's fine. But order an asbestos test at the same time as you're completing that work. If your local air quality control uh, people come and show up and say, uh, you know, they, they will not care that it was an emergency repair. They will just say, hey, uh, yeah, that sucks, but here's your fine. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's emergency work, you still have to get it, the testing done, even if the testing is done concurrently with the emergency repair work. All right, so there's my little no one cares bear. <laughs> so here's the federal rule. To sum it up, an asbestos survey must be completed before renovation or demolition. And demolition doesn't just mean tearing down a, a complete building. Demolition, the, the definition of that is taking out any load-bearing element. So if you're removing a, a, a beam or taking out a wall, that would be, uh, that would be classified as demolition and we need to do that survey. A licensed asbestos consultant or LAC, that's the person that you want to perform that asbestos survey. And then during the course of the work, you, you must have that survey available on site so that, God forbid, if one of those people shows up and checks your job site, you, have, you can provide that to them there and show that you've already had it done. Um, getting back to licensing, if you do find that there is asbestos there, it has to be performed by a licensed asbestos contractor. So that, that is a state certification license. There's an LAC like me, who's the consultant, and there's the other kind of LAC, which is an asbestos contractor, and they're the ones that can perform that asbestos removal. Okay, do we have questions from this part? Okay. Um, I, uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna drop back on the slides for a minute. I'm just gonna go back to the contract because I, I forgot to share the hey, one. Hey, Andy. Yep. So if you're de de doing demolition on a pool, let's see they're doing a pooler model, is there a potential asbestos issue? Yes, because it's concrete. So anytime you're dealing with concrete, if you're, if you're disturbing it, if, if you're messing it up, that is going to require a test. So things like concrete, stucco, those are what we call cementitious materials, and all of those require a test if we're disturbing it. All right, so what if you already did a survey? What if you already had a survey and you have uh, recorded areas that might be affected in any future projects? Do you need another inspection? Um, that is a little bit of a gray area. And it's a gray area because who knows if you've performed repair work since that survey was, was completed. You know, so you, say, you com say you had a survey done in 2015, but then in 2018, you, you came in and did a bunch of renovations. So a lot of times that's going to come down to the comfort level that the contractor has, and it might be worth a, a, a call to your local air quality jurisdiction and, and your air quality department and talking to them about it. Generally speaking, they're very cool on the phone. They're cool to talk to. You can remain completely anonymous. You don't have to tell them your building or where it is. All you do is tell them, hey, here's what I got going on. What do you think? Um, I've had great success in being able to call them. Does that help? Yes, yeah, very helpful. Okay. Um, there's some construction work going on in my building. Are you guys hearing that? Is that is that affecting you or can you not hear it? 
Not as bad as you'd think. I'm sorry? Not as bad as you'd think. Okay, good. So what I wanted to say about the contractor and contracting, um, what a, a lawyer that I was speaking with yesterday made a good point. Um, basically, when we're looking at large construction projects, we're thinking about, okay, a payment and performance bond. Um, sometimes we, we will get that for projects. So it's called a payment and performance bond. And what that does is that means that, God forbid, if everything goes to hell on the project and the contractor walks off of the project, you can still get this, this project taken care of. So the bonding company will give the association funding to complete that project. So that's called a payment and performance bond. There's, there's two reasons that we want to think about getting a payment and performance bond. The first is, um, the, the first is for the obvious that if the contractor walks off the job, <clears throat> we have money to, and funds to take care of the job. The second reason is contractors really, really do not want you to call their, their, sure, their, their bonding provider. Um, the reason is that that impacts their, um, their bond rate. So that makes all jobs where they have to offer a bond in the future more expensive. Uh, the worst thing in the world for, that a contractor can have happen or one of the worst things is for a, a performance bond to be called in on them that, that the bonding agency says, yep, we, we caught you. We're, we're going to go ahead and, <clears throat> and nail this bond. So that, that reason is when a job is bonded, usually it's a great encouragement for that contractor to perform better work and to make absolutely sure that their best guys are on the project and that it's taken care of. They're going to take a lot of special care if that job is bonded <clears throat> because it's so painful to a contractor if, if they have to call in that, that bond uh, for, for whatever reason. So like the primary reason to get a bond is, you know, or at least the reason on paper is so people have money to complete the project if the contractor walks off. But the real reason and, and kind of the secret best reason is that just by and large contractors will pay much more attention to a bonded contract than they might otherwise if a project is unbonded. So just a little uh, nugget that I found for you guys just thinking about on larger projects. And like I said, I didn't come up with that. Another a, a lawyer that I was talking to came up with that, but I, I think it's accurate and true. And I hope you find it helpful um, if and when you, you work on projects in the future that are large. I'm going to leave it there because I like my cat. Um, are there other questions uh, from my presentation uh, before we move on to the next section with, with the panel and, and doing all that? It looks like we're all caught up on the questions on the Q&A. Uh, okay. We might have some more at the end when we have a panelist discussion. I'm excited for the panelist discussion. I've actually got some questions for some of our lawyers and some of our engineers. So um, okay. thank you. Let's keep an eye on the clock and uh, let's keep rolling. Okay. Okay. Can we introduce uh, Jimmy, please? He's back on. Jimmy, he's got his audio. What do you got for us, Jimmy? <laughs> Oh no, James, it was you working earlier, I thought. Uh, we we're not able to hear you. You have your mute on the bottom left. No, it doesn't look like he's muted. Perhaps you could also call in. That might be another opportunity. Uh, I'll go ahead and share that information with you there uh, via email. So um, Rudy, that that's really all that I wanted to, to get into today. Um, we, we didn't have a ton of questions, so there's it, it's kind of, Basically, I, I don't really have a whole lot else for you unless you have specific questions about my presentation. I covered everything that I wanted to cover, and um, I, I hope that people, you know, have a better understanding of uh, things to think about if and when they get into large construction projects. Excellent. We're going to go ahead and open it up to the um, to the panel discussion. Um, Jonathan, you want to kind of take the lead on that? Yeah, you know, that'd be wonderful. Um, so I work with FinTeam Software. I'm a managing director there. Uh, and what we do is we build uh, software for HOA and condominiums. So ultimately, you know, at, at the core of any good project, whether it be, uh, you know, painting, con painting or construction or restoration, uh, ultimately communication is there at the core, right? You've got to make sure that uh, everybody kind of knows what their role is, what they're supposed to do uh, on the resident side as well. And, and that's kind of what Ventium does. 
So we'll help you out with email, uh, SMS, voice automated messaging. So if you, know, you type up a paragraph of text, we convert it into an audio file, kind of like a Siri or an Alexa. Uh, hopefully none of those devices uh, sort of freaking out in the background, uh, but it'll actually go ahead and send out a message to each, one, each resident individually, which is really neat. Um, we could also help on the decision-making side. We're coming out with a really neat tool here towards the uh, middle of September, uh, beta to start, but ultimately allowing uh, committee members to collaborate on a virtual meeting, uh, vote right then and there, uh, really helping everybody out with this, uh, you know, current climate that we're in with COVID. So, um, yeah, thank you. I, I do appreciate uh, uh, everybody joining here today. And uh, let's go ahead and I think we'll pass it over to Lisa. Hey, Lisa, are you there? You're muted if you are. Lisa might have to step away. I know Carmela's not on here. Um, Katie, is Katie on? There you are. Hello, I'm Katie Phillips. I am with Rosenbaum PLLC. We are a full service law firm down in West Palm Beach with an office also in Stewart. We do everything in house, your collections, your general litigation, your general association matters. And one of the things we do and we do very well is we, we do the contracts for your projects. Um, Paula Mera is here, I'm gonna introduce her now. She is a panelist and uh, she definitely does recommend AIA contracts. So Paula, maybe you wanna do a little talk I about that. I do, <laughs> thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to see you on this Friday morning. We've got the weekend ahead of us, which I know we all need. Um, so I'll jump right in. My name is Paula Mera. I have practiced in Florida for 17 years, primarily in condo, HOA, uh, a lot of country club law as well. And it is super important. I think that's the balance of what we're talking about today is how do we get into our projects as board members? What do we look for? What are the pitfalls? And certainly when you are entering into a contract, it never ceases to really surprise me. And I'll start with this, that oftentimes when the attorneys are involved, when my colleague Steve, who's practiced for 26 years, or our shareholder Dan, who's practiced for almost 40, I believe, Typically, we're called when the problem arises, when the contractor walks off, or when there are some issues with delay times or um, project management. That's when we're called. But what I'd like to implore, and I think the main takeaway point today would be when you are a board member and you're entering into a contract for a project, please contact your attorney. It's, it's very well worth the attorney's fees. Ask your attorney in advance, how much would it be to Look at this contract, whether it's for $40,000 for something perhaps small or your $250,000, up to your $2.5 million contract. I can't tell you how many times I've had clients come to me with even a $2 million contract that wasn't reviewed by an attorney and is perhaps not an AIA contract that needed to be reviewed. And all of those contracts, when you get to those dollar amounts, have all of the contracts flowing through them, whether it's an engineer contract or other contractors that are going to do the painting or um, other work related to the main project. So um, I'll kind of kick it off with that and, and let the other panel members speak upon that. But I think the main takeaway point again for today is when you even do have a small contract, if you have a reliable attorney who knows what they're doing, it's worth taking your contract to the attorney just to make sure that the addendum um, that we may provide, we have standard addendums even for your smaller contracts which relate to insurance, making sure that your contractor is insured, even for your smaller projects. That's excellent. I would, I would really recommend that, you know, on the contracting side, and, you know, we do millions and millions of dollars in work in the state of Florida. We're, you know, one of Sherman Williams' largest Florida customers. And we really love when a lawyer gets involved because we know that everyone is protected. We know that there's not going to be any finger pointing. If you've got even a a project that where you don't technically think you should get a lawyer involved, we would also recommend that you do get that lawyer involved, get that engineer involved, um, you know, get an owner's rep involved. There's been so many projects that I've been on and I'm talking three, four, $500,000 projects where there's six board members that are probably all over the age of 75 and they're retired and they're, they're just ripe for someone to take advantage of them. And for them to make such a huge decision 
you know, sometimes even a million dollar decision. And just on the contract, that's just based from the contractor, you know, they need some representation. They need somebody else to, to go ahead and go over, you know, that contract with them. So um, at Money, we highly recommend that you do get a, a lawyer, an engineer, a project manager, an owner's rep involved when you have a, a large project. It will make sure that everyone is protected and it will go um, a, lot, a lot smoother. So thank you, Paula. Thank you. And again, I think from a board member's point of view, when you're addressing an issue, there are, you know, there's a, a myriad of issues we could talk about today. So let me use a sidewalk issue where you have a premises liability um, that, that may be arising because your sidewalks are two and a half inches uh, lifting from the other level. So then you have an ADA issue. You have, an, you have a premises liability issue, even if it's not an ADA is, is, issue because somebody could trip and fall. So you go into that as a board and you're meeting on a monthly basis and you have discussed the sidewalk issue for probably, uh, in my experience, I see this go on for eight, nine months, but then uh, it's a root lifting issue, perhaps it happens all the time. So that contract may be 70 or $80,000, but even with that, um, the project manager comes into play when you need to make sure that you level that project in a time that makes sense for the community, that you've communicated to the community how that project works out, how uh, the phases will work. And also, again, are the contractors um, insured? Do you have the appropriate certificates that you need to have? And again, likely the contractors in Florida, it always surprises me when we see these contracts come through and I'm not disparaging any of these hardworking individuals that are out there to do their job right but typically it's always missing the insurance certificate for you know, liability certificates, et cetera. So we do, uh, Steve and I and our firm actually has um, an addendum. We provide that at a rate that makes sense for those lower priced contracts. And then the association board of directors has consulted their attorney. They're protected because they know that now we have those certificates of liability um, as the associations and additional insured for those contractors that will be on your property. And also for when you need to finance that, and I believe Lisa did join in. Oh, hi, Lisa. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Elkin with Alliance Association Bank, and I'm pleased to be a panelist today. And I kind of wanted to start it off with the fact that Alliance Association Bank, all we do is association deposits and loans. And with, with our bank, we're here to help you with all sorts of funding options for your projects. And one of the most important things is that, um, as Paula was talking about, is consulting with your attorney. If I get a call and, and a board member or property manager says that they want to, you know, move forward with, you know, move forward with a project, the first thing I say is, does your association have the ability to borrow money? And many times they come back and they're like, well, of course we can borrow money. I'm like, you may not be able to, and you, make, you need to make sure you consult your attorney. So therefore, as Paula was talking about it, with that, that's one thing that you need to keep in mind is always making sure that your association has the ability to borrow money. Now, another option could be that you find out you can borrow money and then we can go ahead and propose you know, financing to help make sure you have the money for the project. So you may say, well, we already have reserves set aside. Well, that's great. Well, maybe you don't wanna use all your reserves. So therefore you can use a portion of your reserves and finance the rest. So there are different funding options available. Um, there are associations that have reached out to me and said, well, I want to do this project and I don't want to have these huge special assessments for the owners. So it's sometimes the best thing is to supplement your reserves with a loan. So those are just a few things to keep in mind in terms of funding options. That's accurate. And again, I, it's such a broad topic today, but I, I really like it because when we're talking about projects, even with respect to what, what Peggy does, or what Beth does, we could be talking about a project when your country club um, facility, the building itself, you, you've pulled that wallpaper back that's been on the walls for 20 years and there's mold behind it and there's been a leak you haven't discovered. And now you have a $20,000 budget item that you haven't budgeted for. 
and the option comes into do you amend your budget do you have the ability to um, line item that that difference do you have a reserve for your country club hopefully you do it's going to depend on your HOA or condo those reserves are always going to be specific to either of those types of entities but as Lisa points out now we have as a board a project where we didn't discover it until until the leak worsened and we have an issue with respect to our country club bathroom um, where the wallpaper has peeled off and now we have an entire toxic mold issue that we have to deal with, right? So now we have to pull in the remediators. We have to address the fact that we're gonna trust our remediators, which is an important component. You're gonna get a couple different opinions on that. And also, as Lisa pointed out, you're gonna make sure that we have the money to pay for it. And it could be a huge expense. You guys were talking about asbestos when I walked in um, from my hearing. Um, it could be a minor expense. It could just be a little bit of black mold behind it and it's not a big deal. You're gonna fix it and you're gonna go forward and it's gonna be a minimal expense. But the spectrum is it's, it could be minimal, you can pay for it or it could be major. And then you have to reach out to Lisa or another financial institution to cover that cost to make sure that the project can be paid for. And again, you're also gonna reach out to your professionals to make sure you're getting the right opinions. The project could also be you're redoing your landscaping entirely because that's going to be in a sense um, uh, a capital improvement so to speak but you're also going to make sure that your project is dealt with in a in a manner where you're walking through the steps and i think most importantly you're using the professionals that you need to use as a board you are volunteers so make sure you reach out to the important professionals and even in a landscape contract where we had a landscape contract i think it was one hundred fifty thousand dollars. make sure that you again consult your attorney and you are getting good advice with respect to what that particular contract provides. So Lisa, Lisa, I have a question for you. So at what point do, do associations get involved with lending? Do you see lending coming through for, you know, a $50,000 landscape project or a $50,000, um, you know, pipe renovation like Paula does, or, you know, for a painting? At, you know, at what kind of what dollar amount do they reach out to you for CapEx projects? Okay, so so normally our minimum loan amount is 100000 So anything below 100000 most of the time we, we recommend basically a special assessment because 100000 is our minimum amount. And if you think about it, you can combine multiple projects. Like for instance, if you're doing a painting project, that may be only eighty thousand dollars or something, but maybe you need to put some, you know, additional landscaping in there. You need to have some other projects that you want to do. So we can offer you hundred thousand, and you can do, let's say, your painting and your landscaping. And then also, I know we're in Palm Beach. I live in Palm Beach County, but you have Broward and Miami Dade that have the forty-year recertification. So again, you can have a whole laundry list of projects that you have to do. So um, actually I've had structural engineers reach out to me because they basically found the defects with the building and they're like, look, this board and this association really needs to do the project and they don't have the money to do it. So I've, I've also been able to do a lot with the 40 year recertification because the key thing with, with that is, although it's only in Broward and Miami-Dade, one of the most important things is I think for those communities in Palm Beach County is to make sure that they prepare now. If their building's 35 years old, you know, there are projects that you're gonna need to be doing. Most, one of the most important things too is when you live in a condo and homeowner association, is basically all of us as a team effort, your attorney, your commercial insurance, your landscaper, you know, plumbing, et cetera, we're all here to basically protect, maintain, and enhance your community. And because the board members care about their community by getting these projects done, nobody wants a loan, but they're gonna want what they get with a loan, which is normally an increase in the, in the market value of their community. So if you have the two condos next door to each other, and you have someone looking to buy in a, in a condo and the condo next door has just done a major concrete restoration project, then you're like, wow, that would be a great building for me to look at. Because what happened to me is when I moved into my condo building, I made sure that they had just done their concrete restoration because I did not want to have to go through it. It's quite a big project. It's a very costly project. 
And so therefore, when it comes to the financing itself, it's really important that most cases, it's important to have a reserve study. I know a lot of boards say that they don't feel that they need to have a reserve study, but when you're using maybe a professional property management company, you can be able to determine what projects you're going to need to do down the road. So we as the bank, we're here to really help you get those funds that you need to get the projects done. And the way we look at it is working with all the different professionals, we're all here as a team together to really make sure that we're helping you keep up your property. Board members are volunteers, they care about the community, we as a whole team care about helping you maintain that community. So with our bank, we offer, two, we offer different types of financing. Um, we offer everything from a construction line of credit to a term loan, and we also offer emergency lines of credit. Now, as you know, 2020 has definitely not been uh, the best year for most of us, and we're already barely into September. I mean, not quite into September, and we are getting into the heart of hurricane season. I have associations that have already applied for emergency lines of credit because they are concerned. Because if they go ahead and get that emergency line of credit, and for instance, um, you know, a hurricane comes through and destroys the landscaping on their property, guess what? Brightview is going to be like, well, let's see, they have an emergency line of credit, we're going to get paid right away. And so they're going to be able to get that, get that debris removed right away. When I was here for Hurricane Andrew, I lived in a condo, and we actually had a tree that uprooted and got right into the driveway, actually destroyed some of the cars, and we were able to get we were able to get that tree removed pretty quickly because that particular association had emergency line of credit. For the other projects, when we were talking about the 40-year research, is that it's kind of like when you do a construction line of credit, you're only paying interest only during the project. So you're getting the project all completed, and once it's completed, then you're going ahead and terming it out. So you can term it out for up to 15 years. So we offer everything from a two-year emergency revolving line of credit to a construction line of credit that's usually for 12 to 18 months. So during that construction period, as you know, most of the time when it comes to the construction period is you are paying interest only. There are some associations that say, well, we're going to go ahead and still pay down some of the principal, which is fine. But you have to think about it that during that period, that's when all the active construction is happening. So if you go ahead and you decide that you want to term it out before, let's say the one year construction period, you can go ahead and do that. So we try to be as flexible as we can because with our bank, we only do the financing for associations. That's the only type of banking that we do. And so a lot of board members are like, well, they're concerned or they think the residents are concerned about getting a loan for the association. And the reason is, is that really with the collateral, they're like, what sort of collateral do is there really involved with it? And with the collateral, we don't want your swimming pool. We don't want your clubhouse. We're basically just taking the pledge of the assessments. So we look at different credit metrics when it comes to, you know, getting a loan. Awesome. That's so awesome. That's very interesting. I'm, 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 thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, Beth, I got a question for you. What are some of the common mistakes that you see when somebody's tackling a landscape project? I think the number one mistake that we see is that um, they don't run the contract by their association attorney. Uh, they don't want to spend the money and they think that, you know, that they can just read it and make sure it's, you know, it looks fine. Um, and it ends up you know, causing a lot of problems down the road. Um, so that's one of the problems. I think one of the other problems is that they don't begin with the end in mind. So maybe they're redoing the clubhouse or redoing the pool, redoing the parking lot, and they don't think about the landscaping from the beginning. They just think, well, we'll just put it in after. Um, and that's really, it really needs to be um, planned out from the start because there are a lot of important factors like having, you know, the right tree in the right place, uh, roots, you know, 
how that is going to impact, um, you know, paving and some of the other elements, irrigation, um, you know, some of the electrical that goes along with it, landscape lights, uh, all of that stuff really needs to be part of the grand plan from the very beginning. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Paula, um, I've seen your product at trade shows. I've always been amazed by it. Um, I would imagine that the opportunities from the cast iron pipes, how big is that opportunity? How many of these buildings have uh, these issues uh, that kind of need your product and your services that you're seeing? Paul, are you there? Looks like she's uh, she's on mute. I, I do have a couple questions that came in from the uh, RSVP field uh, as folks registered. Um, so I could also go through a couple of those. Yeah, um, so this one is from uh, Lizbeth. Uh, what do we need to start, uh, you know, if we're looking to rebuild a building, what does the start of that look like? This might be best for Andy. Um, what do you think about that? Um, so the, the question was, if, if you're looking to rebuild a building, Correct. what does that look like? Right. Uh, okay, so generally speaking, um, as uh, uh, Paula pointed out, uh, I, my suggestion would be to start with the professionals. Um, start by talking to a registered architect or licensed engineer about what you want, what you think you want to do. And, you know, I, I would call that, you know, um, technical term would be like a feasibility study, but uh, in, in a practical sense, it's more like, okay, does what we want to do make sense? And uh, is this going to cost, you know, something that's just completely out of our budget? So first thing I would want to do is just get an, an order of magnitude for what this will cost it is what I'm what I want to do is it's going to cost $100 $1,000 100 you know $10,000 or $100,000 um, even if you're talking in the most very roughest terms with that professional that will give you a reality check on what you think you want to do generally speaking the next step is to have that design professional whether it's an architect or an engineer um, start coming up with the the project manual and uh, at that point, you can work with them to bid the work out to the licensed contractors that, that we talked about um, previously speaking. That is a, if possible, you do want to get your, your lawyer involved at that point because when you're bidding this job out, it's awesome if you can include the proposed contract documents with the bidding documents for that work. And that way, the contractors who are bidding on the work know up front what your expectations are for that construction contract. So you don't come into it and, and say, okay, Mr. Contractor, we want you for the work. And then they say, oh, great, where's your contract? And then that, that's going to hold things up. Lawyers have to talk to each other back and forth. It, you know, if, if you're talking multi-million dollar project, you could be looking at weeks or, or month of delay when the lawyers go back and forth. So big suggestion on that is to, to put your proposed contract documents out with the bidding documents and then get to work and start looking at apples to apples bids. Wonderful, okay, thank you for that. Um, and and uh, another, this is directed towards you, Paula. Um, what is the release of lean best practices? Um, right. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the release of lean best practices is you're always going to make sure that you have the contractor's release of lean with respect to the scheduling, um, as the work progresses, and then of course at the final, and you're gonna get that contractor's release of lien. You may also get some other releases as your attorney deems appropriate from the contractor. Um, so one of the things that I find that happens frequently, the contractor typically is looking for that last payment, and that's where that release of lien magic comes into play. So I don't see a lot of issues with that typically at the end of the contract or the project except when there are some punch out items that haven't been done and then again your attorney is typically involved with the attorney from the contractor and those issues are worked out pretty seamlessly so um, that's that's kind of the easier part your project's done everyone's going to release the lien you've got your punch out items that you want to make sure are taken care of you don't want to release that until those punch out items are completed it's pretty frequent that if you have a contractor who maybe it doesn't have the best reputation is not going to finish those punch out items once you've released 
that and given that contractor the final um, the final payment. So make sure that those go hand in hand. If you do have issues, like I said at the beginning, um, typically we are involved at those types of issues when you have the big concrete restoration project that has gone wrong or uh, you know some major issues that come into play. So at the end of the day, those are when your attorney is involved and hopefully your attorney can work those out for you. But that, that release of lien is a very important component of that. And the final commencement of that and the final payment, um, typically if it's a third or even sometimes 50%, we wanna make sure we negotiate that out. If there are hanging issues, if there are um, issues where the contract has to come back, we're gonna work out settlement agreements where we're gonna hold back additional, we're going to put uh, amendments to that contract to make sure that those are taken care of in a, in a timely manner and in a manner where we're not headed to litigation. Wonderful. Paul, Thank you for that. Paula, you mentioned, I got a question for you. You mentioned that sometimes you're getting involved in projects where the contractor has either um, just walked away from the job. How often is that still happening? You know, frequently what we see happening is there is a disagreement with respect to the performance of the work or how the work is being performed or the quality of the work. Um, and so then it, it's like a bad relationship. Both parties want to get away from each other. And that's when you have to calculate what damages that contractor could, could claim if the association wants to walk away or vice versa. So um, that happens quite frequently. And again, it always happens in my opinion, not always, but frequently happens in my opinion when you haven't had the attorney involved from the get go. And you guys were speaking about the bond earlier. I have a lot of associations that want to get a good deal. They release that bond requirement. It's not something we, we recommend. And I want to also um, uh, encourage or, or point out your engineer relationship for your big projects I can't tell you how important that is, is to have an independent engineer. I have a lot of associations who will, um, you know, take a vendor and then they'll, they, the vendor recommends the engineer, which is fine sometimes depending on the engineer, but you want to be, you want to be cautious. You want to be aware of the fact that your engineer and your contractor should be arguably independent. Um, but that's a fine line. And there's, there's a, a there's a way to look at that. And again, your attorney can help you and assist you with that. Um, I do have a lot of clients that will use independent engineers who are not from your larger companies or who are just on their own. And I'm not, again, not disparaging those individuals, but just be aware of the fact that your engineer relationship and your contractor relationship need to be um, independent because your engineer is there to protect the association's work and quality and what's being done. To piggyback on that, uh, Paula, I, this is a question um, that came in during the reservation process. Uh, what are some of the pro cons of using an independent uh, project manager? And I'm sure Annie's got some opinions on this as well. I think there are some pros and cons because again, as a volunteer board, um, you have a liaison, I'll, I'll, I'll describe it as that, to make sure that everyone is working together and you are not spending your volunteer time managing a multi-million dollar project for which you may not have the type of experience to do so anyway. So I think there are a lot of qualities um, that, are, that are a pro. Um, I don't really know of any cons unless you have a project manager who's not doing their job. So when you have a really big project, um, a project manager makes a lot of sense because again, you are a volunteer board member and you may be out of your element with respect to what that project um, concerns. And ultimately you are a volunteer board member. And so with any spectrum of what we guide our board members with is when you are um, making sure that you're maintaining that fiduciary duty, which is the best interest of the association, that you are relying upon your professionals. And you're doing so perhaps at a quality um, of service and a reasonable expense, but you are a volunteer and make sure that you are making um, reasonable choices with respect to how you're carrying out those big projects. Very cool, thanks. Uh, Andy, do, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, using an independent project manager to oversee a large project? Um, it, generally speaking, in my 
opinion, there's no reason not to use an independent project manager. Um, as Paula pointed out, most of most of our boards are laypersons. Um, even if they have been involved in the construction industry, they're not generally going to have been in that very specific construction industry for that industry in that in that locality where they're located. So it's, it's a really highly specialized thing. Um, the only downside that I would suggest is just to vet that property manager very carefully. Generally speaking, you want it to be a design professional such as a uh, registered architect or licensed engineer. Um, you know, the, the downside that I have personally seen is I get a lot of ex-contractors that, that become project managers and they kind of act like a design professional even though they are not really a design professional. Um, I see it a lot in roofing where I see former roofing contractors. Now they're, now they're big project managers and designers um, and to a lesser extent with, with the other stuff with buildings. So the, my recommendations for a design professional, um, ballpark on cost to have an engineer involved with your major repair project from start to finish, it generally adds about 10% uh, to whatever the cost is. So you have $100,000 plan on $10,000 to get that engineer involved from start to finish. Um, it might be a little bit less for architects. Um, so that, that kind of gives you some idea of what it costs to have someone like that involved. I'd like to interject something also. Um, as you all know, I formerly worked with uh, GRS management, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, it, this came up many, many times of would the property manager, and I speak to the board members primarily that are on this call, uh, would the property manager be able to oversee as a point of a qualification for a management company to oversee projects that really need project managers or engineers involved? And I can tell you from experience, just like Andy is telling you, that you, know, you absolutely need a professional in that area uh, because the property managers are licensed managers in managing the property, not managing projects that are multi-million dollar projects. Some of them, very rare occasion, do have some extra qualifications. Again, that would be additional charges uh, the management company is going to expect, or you may have to take that person and make them a project manager and then bring in an additional property manager to continue with the day in and day out operation features. But to expect your property manager, and it's not really about the money, to be the professional that you rely on with no experience or the experience that's needed as a property manager uh, is, is very, uh, uh, it's not recommended. Uh, and again, the reason being that they're really not qualified uh, or many times insured uh, the management company does not carry, like JRS does not carry the insurance for a project manager in, in that area. So that's just something to be cautious of, uh, to expect uh, additional fees, like Andy was saying, for a good project manager. That's Thank all. you very much for that, Peggy. Uh, we had a message come in from Guillermo. Uh, as a LCAM manager, is there additional license we could uh, or should get to be a project manager to kind of piggyback off of that, Peggy. Uh, Paula, would you be able to respond to that? Well, I'll let Andy also um, pitch into this as well. It's not my understanding that a project manager in Florida is a license under the DBPR as a project manager. It would just be someone who um, would be assisting and has specialized knowledge with respect to whatever project that you have. And assisting, and again, Peggy, thank you for that comment because Oftentimes we see, um, so many times, the boards rely upon their association manager to be the liaison or the project manager between the contractor and the project and the board. And a lot of times it's, it's just too much and then many times it causes a lot of distension. And then frankly, uh, again, depending upon the project, if it's specialized knowledge, they have no business um, guiding the board with respect to whether or not things are being done, the timelines, the performance, the quality, et cetera. Uh, 100% what, what Paula said, and there's there's not a state certification for project management. Um, there's all kinds of you know third party uh, places you, you can you can look at to get tips and and maybe get some kind of aftermarket certifications for project management, but it's not a state certification. 
And generally speaking, um, I, I think it's left best left to the professionals, as she she noted. And I don't want to offend any property managers out there that have gained experience uh, in the degree or to the extent that's needed for specific projects, but I'm just cautioning the boards to verify that with references, just as you would verify a qualified management company to come in, uh, verify the projects that this manager has performed. You know, if they don't have experience in concrete restoration as a project manager, that doesn't mean they don't have experience in a pool renovation. Maybe they've done a lot of pool renovations. So it's just a caution. Thank you for that, Peggy. Uh, I've got another question that comes from Arnold. Uh, Andy, this might be directed best towards you. How does the HOA select the best contract, right? We've been talking a lot about professionals here, making sure that you're, you're selecting the, the best option. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of different fact factors to consider. Uh, how does the board, you know, make the best decision when it comes to a contract? Andy, are, are you able to hear me? I, I can hear you. I'm sorry. I, I thought you had said that it was directing directed questions to someone else. Um, okay, so yeah. the, the question yeah. is, how to select the best contractor, uh, right? We've yeah. been talking a lot about a lot of professionals. How do we, yeah. you know, sift out the, the best one? Yep, so, uh, sorry, I, I'm waiting now. Um, generally speaking, we can, do, we, we can do ourselves a great service by asking for project specific references within the last, you know, year or two years and not not just general reference list but okay if i'm doing a balcony restoration project i want to see balcony restorations um even better if we can go see projects where that contractor is currently working give me a list of projects in my city or within 30 minutes drive that my my board can drive to and go see this contractor in action and actually see the workers they've got out there see what it looks like and, and talk to people where they are currently working. Um, probably a red flag of the contractor says, well, I actually don't have any active projects going on at this time, but you know, so, so try to see where they're currently working, go look at the projects and, and talk to the, the foreman or, or whoever you can get to that, that you can see. Um, I think that's a, that's a big help. Um, that's my, that's my tip. John, I want, I want to add to that too. I think you need to start with the basics. You need to start with, the credentials, the insurance, the license to make sure that um, that they have all those in line. You would not believe how many contractors do not have the proper qualifications for the specific area or the scope of work that they're working on. Um, number two, you need to go into workman's comp. You need to go into subs. You want to make sure that the property is um, protected. I think Paula can speak to the fact that, you know, when a contract is done, sometimes that contract is sold and then resold to subcontractors that might not have the license and the qualification and the insurance on the original contract that you signed. Our company, for instance, we have 130 employees in South Florida. They are W-2 employees. We have a payroll roster. We show everyone that look, these employees are insured, they work for us, they're not subcontractors. They need to look for things like that. Andy spoke to references. It is very important for us that we give a list of references, we give a contact name and number, and we encourage whoever that we're negotiating with to go to that project to see it with their own eyes or to contact that person on a similar scope of work. If we're doing a roof mm -hmm. code, we ask you to go to Jupiter Yacht Club and look at the beautiful roof coating we did. If we're in Orlando, we ask you to go to a property in Winter Haven that we did. Um, if we're doing concrete restoration, we ask you to go to you know Mallory Square in Del Rey where we actually you know did that. So not only getting the qualifications, but also getting the references um, is is very crucial. That's fantastic, Rudy. Yeah, you see subcontractors come into play and come into play and come into play, and what type of um, liability does that open up for the um, for the homeowner associations. Yeah. Well, and, and to take things a step further, once you've, you know, kind of got all those documents and, and you've got everything lined up, you've got the licensing, you've kind of got these bids uh, whittled down to maybe, you know, the two or three favorites. Uh, I mean, the next thing you can do is, is kind of put together a, uh, a little presentation, um, you know, making sure that the board has full transparency, uh, that they're able to vote easily. Uh, you know, in, in COVID times, it's kind of tough. 
So using a system like Vintium software really allows everybody to, you know, come back together um, and uh, focus on, on those, those references, those projects, uh, see those images, again, kind of all through a, a video conference like we're doing now. So uh, we found that it, it uh, has the ability to expedite decision making. You know, we don't have to wait to see everybody in person, which might be difficult. Uh, you know, jumping on a phone call, you don't quite have the level of, of uh, transparency and communication that you would through, through a, a video conference like, uh, like we're doing today. So. Paula, I have a question for you. How many times do homeowner associations get in trouble when maybe they hire a certain contractor and he doesn't have the right insurance and there's an accident on the property or they hire the right contractor that has license, but then he subs the work out and that subcontractor doesn't have the right license and there's an accident um, either to the property or to an individual on the property. What, what type of liability can that, can that bring? Well, depending on what happens, um, it's always going to bring litigation, which is where the association doesn't want to be. And if you have a subcontractor, a contractor, or a lot of parties involved, what you do is you sit around a big boardroom, like I'm sitting in today, conference room rather, and everybody deals out their insurance cards. And the last man standing is the man who doesn't have, the contractor who doesn't have any appropriate insurance whatsoever. And typically that's the contractor that you may have a judgment against, but they're walking away with a piece of paper. So uh, when you do have that situation where you haven't um, perhaps done any due diligence and your, your contractor, the subs they use, don't even perhaps have a license or they don't even perhaps have a company, um, then you're looking at an empty pot of, uh, you know, there's no cards to deal at that point in time. Nobody's dealing their insurance cards out. So that's usually the net result. But at the end of the day, again, back to the board members, they're going to perhaps look at those board members. Did you act in the best interest of the association in making sure you hired the appropriate contractors with appropriate insurance? Did you consult an attorney? And that's kind of the bottom line. If, if you can come back as a board member and say, I consulted the attorney, they looked at this contract and my attorney perhaps failed me with respect to making sure that they had the certificates, they have insurance, they were properly insured with workman's comp they were properly even paying their employees. All of those types of things kind of line up. So um, for a project, I think one, again, one of the kind of the main takeaway points is the reason you want your association attorney to look at your contract, whether it's a small one or a big one, is because typically you don't have, and I see it all the time, our main addendum is filled with the insurance uh, requirements for any contractor. Whether it's a $10,000 painting job, a landscaping job, or a $2.5 million concrete restoration job. Our addendum is usually filled with, um, even outside of AIA requirements, the, the insurance requirements. So if, if you ever have to end up in a conference room filled with attorneys, um, hopefully you have at least somebody with insurance that's adequate to cover that damage, that liability. Thank you. To be respectful of everyone's time, we had a 11:30 uh, stop. Jonathan, are there any questions that we didn't cover that we can tackle real quick? Uh, no, it looks like we're we're doing pretty well. Um, so I appreciate everybody joining. Uh, a couple quick last-minute items. Um, there was a couple questions about CEU credits, and um, I think that there were some questions about an HR credit. Uh, I would direct those questions to Paula and Katie. Katie is the education director at Rosenbaum. Uh, you could go ahead and, and get her information uh, and, and reach out regarding other classes that might be offered. Um, also, Andy, a lot of people have been loving your, your presentation and wanting your slides. So will you be able to share those? Uh, yes, I will. I'm going to type in Rudy's email right now. And if these people can, can please reach out to Rudy, um, uh, he, he will send it out to anybody that needs it. Wonderful. We also have one last sponsor, Jonathan. Uh, I don't know if Jimmy can get on now or not. If not, I've got his uh, presentation he wanted me to mention. Okay. Jimmy, are you on? <laughs> it's not oh, working. no. <laughs> Jimmy, no? Yes or no? Shake your head. We can't no. hear him. I, I can't hear him. 
Okay. All right. So let me uh, read this off uh, for him. Uh, James Gonzalez, we all call him Jimmy, uh, is the uh, regional representative for LM Funding, uh, which is one of our sponsors and a uh, longtime friend of mine. Uh, LM Funding is publicly traded on NASDAQ. It's a specialty finance company that manages the association's accounts receivables and using only attorneys and work only for condos and HOA for the collection process. The association is encouraged to still maintain their relationship with their general counsel. Uh, Ellen Funding was established in 2008 due to the housing crisis, which was created, needed for a better alternative to an attorney or collection models. Ellen Funding has managed over 14,000 collection events in our 12 years. Uh, with our priority on web-based software, we engage, manage, and pay the law firms that perform the payment plans and collect for the associations. LM Fundy reduces the AR staff of a management company by monitoring the monthly delinquencies while ensuring their demand letters are on the unit ledgers. No collections, no worries. Contact Jimmy at LM Funding, who pays all the legal bills. Thank you. Um, Andy, we're getting quite a response from uh, your presentation and your sense of humor. We appreciate it. Um, we're going to be, Andy actually teaches five separate classes on roof coatings, on building envelopes. Um, so we'll reach out to everybody when, we, um, when we're doing those. We're going to continue with the continuing education. Um, I love the community I work in. I really miss seeing everybody face to face. But as of right now, we're going to continue with the virtual um, training. And, um, you know, thank you, everybody, for joining and um, you'll hear from us soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is a quick little survey. Uh, we just love to get some feedback uh, as to how everybody enjoyed the presentation. If you could just take a couple seconds to uh, respond to that, uh, that will help us going forward to uh, continue to improve these uh, webinars. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful Friday. Enjoy the weekend. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. And be safe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good one, Paula. Great job, you guys. Thanks, Beth. Have a good one. Okay. Where'd it go? Just gonna have to do. Uh, so I got sample. What about a sample video?